with ADHD. Let's move on and talk briefly about comorbidity, although I have a separate lecture on that. Upwards of 80% of children and adults who are referred to clinics for their ADHD have at least one other disorder. And over 50% of them have at least two other disorders. What sorts of disorders are we talking about here? You see them on this graph. At the top are the impulse control disorders that have to do especially with control of it, impulse, risk of addiction, control of anger and hostility, and generally antisocial behavior. ADHD individuals are at high risk of having those disorders in childhood and adulthood. To the right are the emotional disorders, major depressant, dysthymia, and other mood disorders, particularly the new disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Further down, you see the disorders related to anxiety and OCD, such as tic disorders and many anxiety disorders. ADHD children are at somewhat greater risk of being on the high end of the autism spectrum of disorders, and a small but slightly higher percentage of having intellectual disability. I've already mentioned the very high risk for motor problems and specific learning disabilities that ADHD children have, and that in many cases, though by no means all, will continue into adulthood. Lastly are the personality disorders that you see over on the left, with ADHD leading to especially a risk for antisocial personality, borderline personality, and passive aggressive personality. Now let's put some numbers beside each of these. Here you see the risk that ADHD children have for each of these disorders as they grow up and move into adulthood. Note below around females with ADHD carrying a very specific risk for binge eating, impulsive eating pathology, and even eventually developing bulimia. Otherwise, these other disorders I've already mentioned. And note that for each of them, ADHD conveys a greater risk than we see in typical individuals, often three, five, or even eight times more risk than is the base rate for those disorders in the population. One disorder to pay particular attention to is the development of antisocial activities and conduct disorder through adolescence, which is a strong predictor that such antisocial activities will continue into adulthood. And here you see that risk. This again is from my Milwaukee study, and this is what we found in terms of what percentage of our groups had experienced or had committed, that is, any of these antisocial activities. And you can see that across the board, for all types of activities, people with ADHD that persisted were more likely to have engaged in these antisocial activities than those whose ADHD hadn't persisted. But even in the non-persistent group, many of whom are still symptomatic but not diagnosable, they showed a risk for more antisocial activity than our control group. Look over at the far right two bars. Risk for being arrested, risk for going to jail. Those are very high rates when compared to the typical population. And that has been found in all other longitudinal studies. ADHD poses a striking risk for ongoing antisocial behavior that persists into adulthood. My study identified three kinds of antisocial activities. So if you took all 13 of those antisocial acts and you factor analyze them to understand their commonalities, you get three dimensions. Predatory, which is the use of aggression and weapons against other people. That was mostly related to conduct disorder, not so much ADHD what we called self-sufficient crime, running away from home, stealing money to support yourself, engaging in prostitution, 
to try to support yourself. That type of crime was also related to conduct disorder. But note at the bottom, there are drug-related criminal offenses, possessing illegal drugs, using them, selling them illegally, stealing them from others, or simply stealing in order to get money for these drugs. This was related to ADHD and not just conduct disorder, though the presence of conduct disorder also had an impact on this risk. What this says is that children growing up with ADHD alone, even if they never develop conduct problems or conduct disorder, are still carrying some risk for substance use and sale and drug-related antisocial activity. ADHD children, as we said, have difficulties making and keeping friends in childhood and adolescence, and that problem continues into adulthood, as we found in our studies of adults, such that even those who go on to be married have lower satisfaction with their marriage, a higher likelihood of having affairs during their marriage, a greater likelihood of divorcing their partners, and an increased probability for violence in their intimate partner cohabiting relationships. Notice as well that these individuals were more likely to have had children as teenagers. So seeing an earlier age of childbearing and having their own children to raise. And we found that being an adult with ADHD markedly increased their parenting stress in managing their own children even if their own children didn't have ADHD, though some of them certainly did because of the genetic risk posed by the parents' ADHD. In general, when we look at lifestyle, we see a greater propensity for drifting toward using social media, technology, what you would call screen time, even watching television, playing internet video games with others. They're more likely to do that than socialize with other teens. ADHD children and adults seem to have a particular risk for internet gaming addiction. That risk is about 15 to upwards of 22 percent when we look at studies, particularly studies coming out of Asia. They spend less time engaged in improvement, self-help, adult education, and less time in exercising, all of which suggests that not only are they not going to move further up in their education and employment, they're going to be in less, uh, uh, less physically healthy or well, and they're also going to have a greater likelihood for obesity. We found that, as did other studies, a greater likelihood of having at least one episode of homelessness before age 40 to 41, and as I reported earlier, substantial problems with managing money and credit. One area that my study was the first to examine, but has now been duplicated by others, is the relationship of ADHD to sexual behavior through adolescence and adulthood. We did not document any increased risk for sexual disorders per se, although other studies of adults do suggest that males with ADHD might be more prone to premature ejaculation and that females might be more prone to pain during sexual intercourse or dysmenorrhea. But generally what we found was simply a heightened pattern of risk-taking behavior. With teens and young adults beginning their sexual careers earlier than others, being more likely to change sexual partners during any fixed period of time, so having more sex partners during the follow-up period, spending less time with each partner, engaging in more casual sex out of committed relationships, using contraception much less than other people, all of which leads to a greater risk for a teen pregnancy, for having those children, and a greater risk of having multiple children, in addition to the greater risk you see here for sexually transmitted disease. So people with ADHD are likely to bear their young at an earlier age 
and to be at risk for sexual transmitted diseases more than are typical people followed into adolescence and adulthood, suggesting there is a much greater overall pattern of risky sexual activity going on in this disorder, even in adulthood. Now, <clears throat> what do we do about this? Well, we don't know. I don't know of a single study that has tried to develop psychosocial interventions for this area of risk, other than a few studies recently done using medication management that have documented a much greater reduction in teen pregnancy among teens and young adults who were on medication during their adolescent and young adult years. Hopefully that would continue if they stay on medication, but we don't know. So once again, we fall back on common sense recommendations, educating parents so they know these risks and can supervise their teens and young adults more, educating primary care providers about the risks so that they too can counsel their patients on contraception and on safe sex and so on. Working with other social service agencies that have to deal with ADHD and these teen pregnancies might also be of some benefit. Delaying couples dating, talking to teens about sex and risky sex and use of contraception might also be beneficial. We just don't know. Perhaps recommending the human papillovirus immunization would be a good thing to consider. Why? Because one of the risks for HPV infection is frequency of changing sex partners, that is how many partners have you had in your life, and use of contraception during sex. And we know that ADHD teens and adults are at greater risk of doing those things, and therefore would be higher at higher risk of contracting such an infection. And that puts them at higher risk for cervical, throat, and rectal cancers by mid and late life as a result of that HPV infection. So maybe immunization is one thing to do during late childhood, early adolescence, as these individuals begin their sexual careers. As you can imagine, all of the things that I've just talked about convey a risk for cost to society. And studies now have looked at the excess economic costs of someone with ADHD and have calculated them both on a per year basis as well as on a lifetime basis. Let's take a look at these. Studies indicate that about $1.8 billion is expended in the US for ADHD treatments. Sounds like an awful lot when we consider that. But let's look at the cost that ADHD poses when it's not treated. $12 billion in US healthcare costs, and that's per year. $14 billion in cost of healthcare to the families of those with ADHD because of their increased needs increased ADHD and other problems. $3.7 billion in lost work productivity for the adult with ADHD and for their family members if they're raising a child with ADHD. Overall, the difference in costs between an ADHD adult and a sibling who's not affected by the disorder. That's a very important comparison there because it controls for a lot of other possible background and confounding factors. Notice the difference, $20,000 more per year ADHD costs than compared to a sibling who doesn't have the disorder when we look at healthcare costs, disability claims, and state services that the individual requires. Research in Israel shows that ADHD costs nearly $290,000 more per year for all these other things 
that are risks, the educational risks, the criminal behavior, and antisocial activity, and victim costs, and car accidents, and substance use and abuse, all of them added together come to nearly $300,000 is what society is paying out per year for the cost of unmanaged ADHD. There are other economic costs I don't want to dwell on, but we'll leave you with on this slide and with my handout. And you can see the calculation of costs associated with each of these more specific outcomes, educational outcomes, job status, annual income, and so forth. But as I said, it all conspires together to create a tremendous societal cost or impact of ADHD on our communities, on these families, and on society and our governments more generally. Again, what predicts positive outcomes? Not what predicts ADHD and its persistence, but that someone with ADHD may be functioning relatively well compared to others with the disorder. These are the factors that research shows might pertain to better functioning in adulthood. And by looking down the list, they make imminent sense. So I won't spend any time on them other than to share them with you. In conclusion, ADHD is associated with numerous childhood, adolescent, and adult impairments in virtually every major life activity we have studied to date, including health and wellness and medical problems and early mortality none of which I covered in this lecture because I have a whole separate lecture on the health risks associated with this disorder. We can see that ADHD is a very persistent disorder, even if that isn't documented by the child-focused criteria I mentioned in the DSM. That people with ADHD can outgrow the DSM, even though they may not be outgrowing their symptoms relative to other people of the same age and sex. And we can hazard a guess that about 65 to over 86% of children diagnosed with ADHD will have some degree of ADHD that impairs them in adulthood upon reaching adulthood. Thus, we see that ADHD is a very impairing disorder more impairing than most disorders we treat in outpatient psychiatric disorders. But the hope for people with ADHD is the following. ADHD is among the most treatable of psychiatric disorders. What do I mean by that? We have more treatments that produce more improvement for more people who have the disorder than we see in other psychiatric disorders. For instance, let's look at anti-anxiety drugs. Anti-anxiety drugs are only about one-third the effectiveness in managing anxiety that ADHD drugs offer for managing ADHD and for more people with ADHD. So our greatest problem right now isn't that we don't have good treatments for child and adult ADHD. It's that people are not able to avail themselves of these treatments. Some of them may not be available in the area. Services to diagnose ADHD may not be available in that region. So there's under-identification, under-diagnosis of ADHD, and therefore under-treatment of all of its risks, including its health risks. So given how well and how responsive ADHD is to treatment, our job is to try to remove obstacles to these people getting appropriate diagnostic services and treatments available for them to reduce the myriad of risks that I've shown you in this presentation. Thank you so much for joining me for this lecture. I hope that you found it informative, and I hope that you will uh, register for other lectures of mine in the future. Thank you and be well.